Hello, everybody. <laughs> So um, I was very taken with the, the title of your show, Color, Light, Air, and it made me think of Shakespeare. It made me think of The Tempest and of Prospero in his workshop creating these wonderful things out of color, light, air, and whatever, and I thought of Thomas in his, in his apartment <laughs> at his bench. Uh, Thinking and thinking in terms of these wonderful ephemeral um, substances as actual materials to to uh, in incorporate into your into your work, um, and I just having been in your apartment, I have to say, and had wended my way through the stacks of books that are everywhere, uh, I, I do think it's a kind of magical place in a lot of ways. You say you have read every book, every book that's stacked yeah. five feet high on in columns in your apartment. But I think um, maybe you can tell us what it feels like to be focusing on, on materials like that in a very small space where you're, in each case, creating a work of art that you think somebody may wear at some point. Oh, well, I'm not sure how to answer that. I do think of people wearing the jewelry all the time. My, my biggest concern is weight. But that's the only stopgap for making jewelry for me is how is it wearable, and if, is it not too heavy? Um, but sitting in the studio, my studio is very small, and my apartment is small, and it's extremely crowded. It's not really a living space anymore. It's a studio and a warehouse, <laughs> and I have aisles that are this big to go through, to to get. I can, I can only walk single file. It's like those brothers who, who saved all the New York. Times newspapers and made a Lambert and they, they both died because it collapsed on them. <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel like that sometimes. I'm knocking things off all the time. But one of the great things for me about making jewelry and working with the different materials is when you're at the bench, I have about that much space on my bench to work on. Everything else is bottles and jars and files and you all know how, whoever jewelers, you all know how that is. Is the whole world disappears and you're sitting there working on the universe of this piece. And so space doesn't matter anymore that's around you and that it's crowded because your space is there and the piece that you're working on. So, so let's take each one of those words for the moment and just uh, kind of chat about color. <laughs> when you're thinking of color, how do you think of color? As, as an essence, as um, just Pigment. Well, I had a lot of color theory when I was in school. I had Munsell's color theory and I had Albert's color theory. And I studied to be a painter, and that was my major and a sculptor as a minor. And so color plays a very important part in the work. But each piece I do, um, I'm working on, I guess, a color palette. I'm trying to do something. There's some pieces there that are all white and some pieces that are white and acrylic, and it's how do you combine these colors to make energy in the piece? Um, for me, the color is always subservient to the form, and the form is always subservient to the light. So light is my first consideration. So let's say you, you create a form in your mind, then, the color, then you see it in a color. You'll see an orange or a yellow or a red. Or Not how does always. That work? There, there are different routes. I do a lot of drawing before I begin, and I draw. To, uh, I discovered years ago not to do sketching. I do drawings to scale. They're not rendered or anything, but they're actual size. Use a ruler, or pen, or whatever, or freehand, or what I'm doing. Um, and then I may do anywhere from five to. 35 drawings before I decide which one I want to do. Um, and then I decide on the materials. Sometimes I decide on the material first and then do the drawings. And sometimes I decide on the color before I start, and sometimes I know one color that I want to use. And when I get that color set, then I decide on what other colors are going to work with the relationship of that color to make it sing or recede or are these pre-existing colors or colors in your mind that you then create? 
with uh, using pigments and yeah, I mixing think, colors. I, think, I don't know that I see the colors in, in my mind, but I have names for all of them. Like? So, well, I might say I want this to be pink, white, and gray, but I may not know the value or the tone of pink, white, or gray, or whether the pink is going to have some blue in, in it or some green in and it. And then you will mix it in. accordingly. And then I, I either mix it accordingly or I use it straight out of the tube. Okay. Or the jar. Okay. And you also use raw pigment, correct? Yeah, when, I, when I'm using the raw pigments, those are almost always mixed colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I saw an exhibition uh, some, a couple of years ago at, um, at uh, the Morgan Library. And I'm a big fan of Albers. I studied his theory. And, um, but they had uh, the first exhibition ever of his notebooks with all of his notations on them. And what I found out that I didn't know was Albers never mixed the color, ever. All of his colors are straight out of the tube. And I thought, oh. All right, that's cool. <laughs> and a couple of the brand names that Albers used happened to be a couple of the brand names that I used. So that was a thrilling show for me. That was really great. Are any of these very exotic uh, types of, of colors that you have to send yeah, not to Not necessarily to, uh, exotic. Or? Yeah, I, I, I get most of my pigments, uh, powder pigments, uh, for, uh, not all, but most of them from Kremer Pigmente, which has a store. It's a German company, and they have wonderful colors and pigments and all, all ranges and, and all price ranges. It's a dangerous store for me to walk into because I can't get out without bankrupting myself. But. And so application of the color is, um, you want a color that is going to endure on the, on the yes. material. Yeah. And so how do, you make, how do you make that happen? Or how can you be sure that this color is not going to fade? Well, you can never be sure, but there are, there are colors that are fugitive. Uh, that, uh, and, and colors that are very, very stable. Um, and you just have to pay attention to the colors when you're buying. But it, it's also important to do the underpainting preparation. Um, has to be good. And this is where I'm kind of lucky in my work because I had the training of the, of a, as a painter, so I understand all the processes and how to use gesso and how to do all of those <coughs> under things that I often do with my work. So let's go to light. Then. To light. <laughs> um, if you if you are naming light as a material, um, obviously you're using some translucent materials mm -hmm. that modify light, acrylic. But how else is light utilized in your designs? Well, reflectively and whatever. Yeah, I mostly mostly do brooches or pins, and um, when I'm uh, designing them. I always see it in the upright position as they're being worn on. So all of my work has to do with how the light falls on a piece from up above. Um, and that has to do with the translucencies, translucencies as well, mm -hmm. and how a translucent will be affected by the fabric that's behind it, and how much I can leave of the translucent exposed to change the composition of the work mm -hmm. when it's being worn. I try to take all those factors into the piece. So I guess that would also go for um, your use of air. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, when I when what I, do you mean by that? When I refer to air, I, I refer to it as it's. Uh, I think the clearest in the translucent pieces, where uh, they have a wood base, and then the acrylic is in front of it. So there's a space behind that, and that's what I refer to as air. Okay as opposed to um, positive and negative, which is a different thing for me. So um, we, had this, we had talked about this earlier, that mm -hmm. we wanted to talk about how to wear your jewelry. And uh, the, uh, at your exhibition um, last Saturday, um, we were, I was walking and looking at the jewelry, and there was a woman next to me, and she said very seriously, are these to be worn? And I think sometimes we make an assumption with uh, contemporary jewelry that everyone knows that, they're, that it's to be worn. But in, in Thomas's case particularly, these are works of art that might also be just considered as just objects of contemplation. Um, however, 
there to be worn. And should they come with a list of directions from you? <laughs> how do you uh, how do you advise us on on how uh, how ultimately should we think about them as worn pieces? How should we wear them? Yeah, I, I think not just my work, but contemporary jewelry as a whole. I think it since they're meant to be worn, I, I think a relationship to the clothing is very important. So, you know, if you um, Andrea asked me to wear a piece today, so I wore this one, which is not an easy piece to wear. And so I just lined it up with the, the, either the line of my coat or the, the collar, but I try not to go over something. So it's just a matter of thinking about the clothing that you're wearing and what relationship that pin will make on your uh, body in relationship to the clothing you're wearing. And this was a pin that I made. I was going to do a series. I only did a couple of them that I called clavicular pins because of the clavicle bones. And the original idea was to wear it across on a sweater like this. But I chose this one today because of the length of it and to see how it could be worn on a jacket. So. So have you ever, you know, seen somebody wearing one of your pieces and it's like we're being worn completely wrong and you go up to the, them and say, please, please let me reposition this on your torso? <laughs> no. I've only done that once when someone said, am I wearing it in the right place? And I said, it could be better over here. And so, <laughs> so we changed it. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, the Met, the Met show, um, uh, the Body Transformed is the name of the current show at the Met, as many of you probably have already been there to see it. Um, do you believe that jewelry transforms the body, and especially as, as it concerns the brooch? Because the brooch can be really anywhere. You know, earrings have to be here, and necklaces here, and bracelets here, and rings here. But the brooch can sort of, you know, be anywhere it wants to be. <laughs> um, how does that? How does how does a person relate to that? Just as an ornament, or how are we wearing that? Why are we wearing that? Well, one of the reasons I do mostly brooches is because. They can be worn anywhere, and they don't. You don't. I, I never do two of anything. I don't do two earrings. I don't, do, I, or I don't do anything that holds things together, like a belt buckle or cufflinks or anything. And I think you have lots of options with brooches. You can wear that up here. You can wear it on your hip. You can wear it on your shoulder. You can wear it many, many places. And in terms of the the fabric for your particular kind of jewelry. Um, Everyone in New York wears black, so it's sort of not a problem, you know. <laughs> yeah. But um, are there are there particular fabrics, colors that you prefer to see your jewelry displayed on? No, but it's an interesting question because I once saw a woman who had a piece of mine who was wearing it on a very flowered print dress. Big, big flowers all over and colors, and I thought my work would never work on that. And it looked absolutely terrific. What kind of piece was it? What you know, I can't even remember the piece, but it was a fairly, fairly minimal piece. Um, but I never thought it would work on a pattern fabric of flowers, and it, it looked just great. So I think whatever works, then that's how you use it. So let's talk a little bit about materials. Mm -hmm. um, you invented a material for yeah. one of the pieces. Yeah. And I don't know if you have a, you can, can you describe that material and did you put a name to it yet? No. <laughs> uh, I, I, yes and no, or no and yes, I don't remember that, or, or here's a question. It's just, um, I've been wanting to work with marble dust for a long time. So I just made a material using a resin and marble dust and pigment, so it's almost like, um, uh, stucco on a wall. And one of the pieces here has that. Um, but because uh, I tend not to do very, merry, very many experimental uh, things, I, I do make little samples of things to see if things are going to work, but I tend to just plunge into the work and think, well, it's either going to make it or it's not going to make it. And I did three pieces that way, and they all turned out, luckily. But my intention was to use this new material on three sections of each. It's kind of an orange, uh, two oranges and a red one on the end there. And the material has thickness to it. So 
because I was experimenting with it, when it dried, I didn't know if the color was going to rub off. I wasn't sure the surface, what it was going to look like. Um, after a few days, the color didn't rub off anymore, and the surface uh, uh, is this wonderful matte surface that's produced by the marble dust. Um, but the other two sections, I didn't know how to butt the material against the new material of it in another color. I didn't know if it was going to run or anything. So I went to a, a, a technique that I uh, kind of worked with before and that is made with um, pumice um, and paint. So that makes a second level. And the third level is just pigment uh, on the surface. So that's how they developed. Was, would, those, would those be the reductions that you're talking no, about? No, uh-uh. Okay, so uh, I learned today that um, they're very painterly pieces a little unusual, I haven't seen those before, that you're doing, but you're not calling them paint or paintings, no. you're calling them reductions because... Well, well they're not really paintings, they're multi-layers of paint, you'll see a few of them there, in which I then go down through the layers of paint. It's, it's certainly not a new technique, it's been done for, for mm -hmm. really a long time on furniture and things, but... So why do you hesitate to call them paintings? Because they're not paintings, they're pieces of jewelry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They're pieces of jewelry, um, okay. We have a couple of people from Portugal here today, and I had done, um, uh, when I taught in Portugal um, uh, at Arco, um, in the art supply store there, which is still there, Ferreras, I think it is, is Ferreras, they had some little tiny cans of this wonderful paint, and I bought all the colors. The colors were beautiful palette. And I brought them home, and I had them for years in New York, and I didn't know what to do with them. And I finally decided to make three pieces. So I made three pieces, and I used this removal technique, because the paint was very thick and plastic-like. Um, and those three pieces were sent to an exhibition in Munich, to which I had been invited, and all three of those pieces sold. So I wanted to do some more because, not just because they were sold, although that was certainly part of it, but be, because I liked the paint. Um, and there was nothing left in the little tins. Um, and so it took me, I think it was almost 10 years before I found another paint that would actually work. And so when I found the paint, it was during making the pieces for this show, and so I made them for this show. Fantastic. Um, let's, uh, t we're, we have a, a oh. on screen we have some of the uh, eggshell pieces which are fantastic and mysterious too. Uh, the more I look at them, the more interesting they become. Um, uh, today I, I felt like I was looking at topographical maps of something, maybe some cosmic <laughs> plane, you know, out there uh, on some planet, but they they seem to get more and more complex over the years and more involved. The 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 patterning seems elemental. It seems like it's just coming out of the earth. Um, have you felt that way in working with the eggshell that it is? No, I'm evolved? a total little non-objectivist, so non I don't see any of that when I'm working on them. Um, so, other people see it, and uh, but I don't so see it. You um, very notably said uh, at, at at a uh, a uh, conference at the Cooper Hewitt, you were asked a question, mm -hmm. and you your response was, "My jewelry has no content." <laughs> and that and that caused quite a stir because <laughs> the whole point right for a lot of jewelers working today is content artist statement concept but you're saying you're being a radical and you're saying <laughs> <laughs> my work has no content I, so tell I, us about that I, I don't know I think everybody else is being the radical I I, I just um, there's no message in my work except the message is the work, uh, the material, the way things relate to each other compositionally and color-wise, and the way the light works. And, and so, by giving you nothing specific, I try to give you everything. Everybody can put their own story to it, and I think when, <laughs> when uh, I like to work that way because I like everybody to put their own story to it.
When people say to you, oh, your work is architectural, seems appropriate for the space that we're in today to just mention that. Um, you work with balsa wood and uh, some, again, it looks like almost you're looking in plan, you know, at a, at a wonderful house that you would like to live in. You know, some of the plastic and wood pieces that I see, I think, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that would suit me just fine. How do you feel about that? I mean, do you, do you consciously think architecturally? No. I don't. Uh, I, I consciously think geometrically, but not architecturally. But if somebody sees a pen and they think, so I'd like to live in that, that's terrific. That's <laughs> just terrific. Yeah, it's very wide. There's the one piece that's 30 some years, and, and uh, other pieces I might do in maybe a month or so. I, I work on many, many pieces at the same time, so I can, can never time it exactly. Well, I guess the, the sun is up there, and so it's always coming from above, and, and most of your homes is coming from a higher place. And so I visualize how the shadow goes on it, or what gets highlighted by the light. No, no, I, I, I work flat down actually this way. And your light is but, I, but I can, um, Andre was asking me if I visualize color. I don't visualize color, but I visualize light. Mm -hmm. So yeah, while I'm working this way, I can see the light. Yeah. And I also have a gooseneck lamp, which I move around sometimes. Oh, and, and often when I'm in doubt, I actually stand in front of a mirror and hold it up with the light up here so I can see how the light's falling on it. But mostly I can see that. I had the fr I made the frame and that was done. That, 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 that took about a year and a half or two years to make the frame of it. Um, my original intention was to do eggshell inlay on it, and I looked at the frame and I thought, oh, I don't know if I can really deal with this. In the meantime, I was doing other egg eggshell pieces, and I've learned uh, a way of working it faster. I've learned shortcuts. I've learned how to manipulate the ma material better. And so I can do an eggshell piece much faster now than I did when I first started doing them. Um, and then one day I, I, I kept looking at it, and one day I pulled it out, I showed it to someone else, and I said I was thinking of doing this in an eggshell inlay, and it was another jeweler, and they said, you might as well do it, you're the only person crazy enough to do it. And I thought, well, that encouraged me to go on. Um, and then I, I did it, and I did all the eggshell, which took quite a while to do. And then um, when I chose the color, I thought I had chosen the wrong color. And it was a very depressing moment, and so I put it away. And it took me about three years before I could take it out and look at it again, because I thought my judgment had to really mellow to decide if it was right or the wrong color, because if I thought it was the wrong color, I would have lost the piece. And when I pulled it out, I thought, oh, this is OK. <laughs> and so then I continued. And what I thought it was I had removed too much color, but, and there was still a lot of color on it. And as I began removing some of the other color, uh, it seemed right. So that's why, that's why it took so long. Yeah, it's, it's the only technique that I don't really talk about. But uh, I will say that it took me six years to develop a process, which is not the traditional one, which is using lacquer. But I had always been very interested in, in it because of um, um, uh, the work of uh, Denard, his vessels and things, and of screens and so on. And as far as I knew at the time, it had never been used in jewelry. It had been used in cigarette lighters and cigarette cases. And I thought it was the perfect media for jewelry. And so uh, that's how it happened. No. I have a, a gooseneck uh, lamp here, flexible one here, and I have one behind me here. Um, in the winter, I don't get enough heat, so the one behind me is on my back. So I get uh, incubated like a, like, like a chicken to keep me warm. And I work with the other one. Every now and then I pull it around and check something and I put it back on the back. <laughs> yes, for example, I would never use rubber. 
uh, which is a material I like very much, but it completely decomposes. There's no way you can say rubber, so I don't touch, touch it even though I really like it. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, I know exactly where I'm going when I start out, and how much happens organically is when I make an accident. <laughs> and then it's, everything changes. The game plan changes. Usually I get a better piece when I've had an accident. <laughs> so, you know. Agnes Martin. Um, I like Mondrian. I like Brock. I like Picasso. I, we, I could go on and on. I like Bernard. I like. Uh, I don't like the Romantics very much, but I like the Pointillists and and um, I probably look at more painting than I actually look at jewelry, if that's possible. I do. But there's a Brock at the Metropolitan Museum that is maybe my most favorite painting of all time. Oh, I wish I could remember the name of it. I think it's the artist studio. Uh, that compositionally is the most thrilling work of art that I've ever looked at. If you get a chance, go look at it. It's about this big. There are about 20 paintings within this one composition. I've spent hours in front of that painting. It's just incredible. You know, it happened the first day in jewelry class. I was a senior and... Um, <laughs> Uh, I always wanted to take jewelry and I had a free class, so I went and took jewelry and uh, I studied with Fred Miller and um, the first thing we learned how to do was put a blade in the saw frame. And when I put the blade in the saw frame and I clicked it to hear the sound to make sure it was right to the ping, that was the moment. And it was because painting never fought me, it would just kind of float off of the brush. And here was something that was going to fight me and do battle, and I thought, this is what I want to do, and I changed at that moment. Yeah. Well, I think, I think architecture is geometry. Where's Ava? <laughs> she's, she's a trained architect. Um, um, it, it is geometry. So I do not think about architecture when I'm doing my work, but I do work in geometry, so it translates right there. Uh, let me just ask you a question that someone asked you at the gallery. Um, why, you know, she said, well, why can't I wear this as a pendant? And you said, well, it's not a pendant. I would have made it differently if it was a pendant. How would you have made it differently uh, if you, uh, you know, you could just put a, you know, a little hook on it and sing it around your yeah, head? I, yeah, I wouldn't have done something that you can put a little hook on and put it in a chain. I would have somehow worked it out so that it would have been clearly meant to be only a pendant and not a pen. I, I think you can work. It, uh, to be a pendant and a pin, if you're careful with your design and how you do it. But for me, I like it to be very clear uh, which is which. That's a difficult question. Uh, um, but I think it goes back to what I said about uh, when you're making a piece of jewelry in a very crowded space that the world is there when you're working on the piece of jewelry. And I think I, when I'm making a piece of jewelry, I get to create my own world over and over and over in every piece that I do. And I think that's part of it. The other part is it's a great challenge to, for me to get these materials to work in a way that you want them to work and to understand what they're all about. If you can, well, I call it the soul of the material researching that. So there's kind of a, a research of the material and, and the actual construction and actually the isolation in the studio is uh, a pretty nice thing when you're working on it. Sometimes it can be a little lonely. I think all artists experience it. But if you're working really hard, you don't feel that. You know, it just, I, I know sometimes I go into the studio. I have to force myself to get in there some, some nights. I think, oh, I don't, I gotta fix dinner, I don't wanna, I gotta do my laundry, and I don't wanna go do that. And I think, okay, I'm going to go into the studio and I'm going to work for 10 minutes because I've gotta get something done today. 
and I'll go in there. And uh, the next thing I know is I look up at the clock and three and a half hours have slipped by. And that's the greatest feeling in the world because then you've really got done and then you don't have to do your laundry. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, I don't think about them in any the emotional terms. I'm thinking of them more in form and content and light and air and materials, but I don't have an emotional attachment to them. I, I, I've, I get asked quite often, do you have a hard time parting with your work if somebody wants to buy it? And, and I don't. Um, but there are a few things that I hold back. Uh, because I like them and I want to wear them myself. But, so I guess I do have an emotional attachment. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a really interesting and astute question. Because A, I don't like Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> <laughs> but B, he was the first architect to really use a cantilever and I was very impressed with the cantilever. And so what you're seeing in my work is a lot of cantilever. And that's Frank Lloyd Wright. So that was a very interesting question for me. Well, part of it is, uh, with soldering, um, I, I taught for many years. And so you're, you're always helping your students with soldering projects. And it's true, you know, when you, when you teach, you're the one who learns. So you're expected to know how to do everything. And of course, you don't know how to do everything, but you learn tremendously. So I reached a point where I could solder really, really well. And I, I, I got so good with soldering that I got bored with soldering. Um, but I felt the difficult one was cold construction. Um, and so I started doing these cold constructed pieces. The question is, is how do you hold two materials which have nothing to do with each other together without using heat? So it becomes an engineering problem. So half of my work is aesthetics and the other half of it is in the engineering problem. So I use these com commercial uh, um, bolts. I do all the threading and everything myself. Um, but uh, and, and the other thing is with these translucent um, acrylics, um, you can't put a translucent acrylic against a painted surface because eventually the painted surface will transfer in spots to the acrylic. So these all have nylon spacers between them so that the materials don't touch. So it's threaded through the acrylic and then it goes through a spacer and then it goes through, these are the basic material under these are aircraft plywood for most of them, goes through that. And I use aircraft plywood because it's very, very stable, but the, the wood is then primed before I begin applying the colors. So it's, it's engineering, but it's engineering based on the material's needs. No, no, I'm, I'm a jeweler. I, I, I do do some sculpture occasionally, but I don't think of them as the same thing at all. Um, when I started making jewelry, um, the average size of a pin was about that big. And I decided to bring up the scale of jewelry. So I really brought the scale up very far with the size of the work that you see there. Now this is considered small because now people are doing pieces that are this, this big around or gluing themselves to a wall as being <laughs> the piece of jewelry. You know. so. I listen to classical music most of the time, but um, there are parts of the day now where I prefer to go. Uh, I like music uh, vocals from the 20s very much. Um, there's a wo woman by the name of Annette Hanshaw, whom I just love her stuff. Um, she started when she was 16 or something and worked for like 10 years. And the, the music in the background is early jazz. It's really terrific stuff. And she ends a lot of her music, she does this song, and then she says, that's all. <laughs> it's, it's really great. I listen to a lot of Argentine tango, about which I feel, if I feel emotional, it's when I'm listening to Argentine tango, it's a very passionate dance, I, I love to watch it. And, uh, and uh, lots of other kinds of music, but 
probably no, I don't listen to any rock at all. I don't. Uh, um, I, I got as far as Mama Cass, whom I loved, and that was kind of <laughs> it for me. <laughs> this because 99 and 99 tenths of a time, color eggshell is only color on the surface. And I do some removal of the surface, so I would go right straight through it. Um, I've only run into two eggs that don't do it. One is emu, which is uh, a pale blue-gray all the way through and is very nice. And um, someone sent me some eggshells of a, a exotic chicken. Um, and that color went all the way through, but it, working on it, it got greatly reduced. But you could see a, a tonal value. So it was a tonal value towards... Um, I'm trying to remember towards, a, towards the blue-gray again, and so I think I used an orange next to it to pull out the blue color of it. But on its own, there was not much difference between the white. This also want to point out oh, I used an intense piece, green. That's what it was, to pull it out. This piece is the one piece in the exhibition that has a title. Yeah, it's the only piece in the title uh, that has a, a title, and it's called Constellation. And this is actually silicone, not rubber on that one spot. And then I do inlays in the heads of the folds. How come it has a name? How come it has a name? And the other ones don't. Because it looked like a constellation, and the other ones don't look like anything. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a naming, a naming contest for, it, it, for it, all it of It kind the of named things. itself, you know. Uh -huh. And, oh, by the way, and the reason it happened was where the uh, pieces with the uh, uh, rubber was a dent in the plywood that I hadn't seen. So it was, do I lose this piece or do I make it work? And so I drilled and threaded and siliconed and inlaid and it came, became a constellation. So. Oh, you know, that, that was done just for the photographer because his computer wouldn't accept it without a name or a reference. <laughs> and this has happened a couple of times in recent publications where they've gotten uh, the image and then they've included number one or number seven as part of the title. It had nothing to do with the title. It had to do with uh, putting them in progression into the computer. You know, I was born in 1936, and I'm probably dying in 2036 or, or, or 2036. Um, I, I'll go as long as I'll, I can. Um, and everything that I made in my life is in that short period of time. In the history of the world, it's nothing. So why not 20th century and 21st century? Uh, every, almost everything that's dated in, my, in books of mine is incorrect. Some things are... I had done 10 years before the date that it actually shows in the catalog. So I decided to, to not do this mix-up anymore and not have to remember the dates myself. Yeah, I think, I think um, the expression, you've cut off your own nose, I've caused a certain amount of problems for myself by doing that because a lot of things that I, that I did before anybody else did them, is, there's no record of that. But it's okay because the thing that counts is the final piece. When you look at the work, if you like that and you think it's successful, it doesn't really matter when you've made it. it only, only what, for me, what only matters is the final piece. So um, the Noya Samalu um, put their stamp of approval on my dating, and it, as did Gallery Loop. Gallery Loop did that first before the Noya Samalu. Um, and um, um, what about signature? <clears throat> Signatures? Do you sign? I them? sign everything, but I don't date anything. But I sign and date my drawings. So there's a whole pile of, I do all kinds of drawings, the kind that's at Gallery Loop right now, which are watercolors and uh, ink drawings. But I also do, as I said, I draw to scale, and so there, I, I will trace those over and use those as working plans. And all the original drawings have dates on them. So somewhere along the line of some archivist gets interested enough in 20 or 30 years, and they, 
my drawings have survived, they can go through and say, ah, we know when you did this one because there's going to be a date on the drawing. Right, but the, the necklace that you finished, you just finished yeah. the drawing might yeah. have been from 33 years ago. Yeah, that's, I, I that's think it's so actually, it might be a little yeah. bit longer than that. But <laughs> they yeah, that's the, that's the eggshell necklace we were talking about. And that's meant for its primary view not to be straight on, but seen slightly from the side. That's where its primary views are. This is shown slightly from the side. So. And uh, that actually fits over my head. So I, I, I usually don't do clasps of any kind. If I do a necklace, I like it to fit over the head. Although the Neue Sammlung has a necklace that has movable parts, but it still slips over the head, so there's no clasp. That was in the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> she tried to trick me all the time. <laughs> well, any other questions? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.